So we begin with a fictional image because the robot came from a fiction. It was a play called Rossum's Universal Robots that was written in 1921. And um, clearly we have lots of modern versions of this earlier play, so Terminator. And on the other side, we see a, a film that was supposedly about the Turing test called Ex Machina. And interestingly, it was directed by a man and the advisors on the projects from the robotics community were also men and they called it a love story. Now, I don't know any woman who believes that being locked in a cage is a sign that someone loves you. So this is, a real, this is really serious. They called that a love story. I thought it was more a film about domestic violence. Um, so this is a reason why we need women in AI. So we keep getting these preposterous images anyway circulated all the time. So somehow we're going to create an exact replica of a human being, and then we're going to put them at a computer as a way to solve our problems. Um, so as a result of all these kind of fictional ideas that are circulating, and these, we've heard some very extraordinary predictions today, there are all these groups that have been set up, including my own. I'm the founder of the Campaign Against Sex Robots. And these groups are really trying to think about what's coming and try to develop ethical ideas around them. But I guess the question I want you to start thinking about is why single out ethics? Why not single out politics or economics? I think there's probably a reason why we single out ethics, because perhaps we can leave the economic structure pretty untouched, but still have an ethical model. So I'm not going to go through all the ethical models, but you, some of the most popular ones, Aristotle, of course, virtue ethics, even though he was a pro-slavery. Um, uh, Immanuel Kant, who did have a manservant, but he wrote about um, anti-slavery. And it said that people shouldn't be used as a means to an end, which I think is a very important philosophical principle. And Jeremy Bentham, which was the individualist model around the greater good. So individuals could be sacrificed like the autonomous car or the recent survey that they did. Um, I think it was MIT where they asked people, who would you sacrifice? Um, I don't think that is a very good question to start asking human beings. And they found out that people would rather sac sacrifice older people than younger people, for example. But when we introduce sex and race into that, is that acceptable for that question to be in asked in the first place? So even the ethics questions need an ethics uh, analysis. And it's quite simply ethics, you know, is a guide to moral behavior. But I don't want people to think there, it is, there is an ethics out there um, that we can kind of identify a formula and that we can use because we can't. There are so many eth ethical paradigms. They have underlying philosophies. And depending on your perspective, you are going to choose one or another. And I thought a good example of this would be um, the European Commission GDPR. And so that's trying to protect citizens from corporations, right? So it's an individualist paradigm. Um, so you protect the citizen against the corporation. But the corporations like Apple are also using the individualist paradigm because they're saying we need to protect the individual from the state. Um, so simultaneously, they're both using a very similar ethical paradigm in order to, if you like, um, justify their ethical platforms. Now, the word citizen was created at a time when only 6% of property-owning men were citizens. But fortunately, we've had a number of working class people, women's rights activists, uh, people of color, that have changed our very understanding of what it means to be human, what it means to be a citizen. And I think we should be thinking about these people when we're thinking about ethics. People have actually gone into the world and done something to change it and improve most of our lives, not the, li the lives of the, the top 1% or 2%, but the majority of people. So I'm going to go back to a story because this is about sex robots. And people think that, you know, I saw a sex robot and I thought, oh, that's terrible. We must get rid of them. Whereas, in fact, the story is much more complicated. And it begins when I go to MIT in the early 2000s. And I get to the lab and I see them making these kinds of robots. And they say, um, as you can see, the robot doesn't have any shoulders. It doesn't even have a torso or um, any, any legs or a base. It's just wheeled around on a platform. And when I get there, they say, these robots are about uh, not about doing work, but they're about being your companions. And I want people to think about that, because I knew when they said that, something had changed in the world. And I want to make a distinction between me as a natural person, a natural human being, and an artifact, a piece of property. 
And what, in effect, they were saying is my needs that we know could only, my needs as a human being could be met by a piece of property. And if you fashion that property into a, a machine, an anthropomorphic machine, and give it some kind of uh, behaviors, some mechanical behaviors, that would be a good enough substitute for a human being. And um, so they not only thought this idea, right, but they then started trialing these robots among aging communities, among people with disabilities. And um, interestingly, one of the problems that they, they frame this around is saying that we've got a crisis of you know, people, loneliness. But why have we got a crisis of loneliness when there are 7.5 billion people in the world? It makes absolutely no sense why we've got this modern problem. Because the answer is not in, the answer cannot be addressed by giving people who are already feeling isolated and alienated machines. So I'm going to give some theoretical background that I've been developing around these topics. So I've split models that are, I think are the orthodox models in our culture into two. The first one is the I model, the egocentric paradigm, the kind of American Ayn Rand individualist, the AI uh, citizen who's going to merge with machines, Ray Kurzweil. <laughs> um, and interestingly, the I model is all about the person being reframed as a piece of property that you can intervene in. And also, if you look at this image here, you've got the social network where you've got these individual nodes. And they're just like systems. They're not human beings. There's no interpersonal relationships. They're just in networks. And then the other model, which is kind of popular among anthropologists, anthropologists and social scientists, is what I call is the we model that everything is connected. We are connected with everything in the universe. So there's no distinction between me and this object and the environment and all these things. And so when I was beginning my research and I, be, I was begin looking at this idea that a machine could become like a person, could become a substitute to a person, I was, had these two models that were basically the explanatory models that I had to make sense of this. And I didn't feel any of them were very useful, and I'll tell you why. And it was through my work in autism that helped me come to a different understanding. So for people who don't know, autism is a social communication uh, developmental disorder. And they started in the lab at MIT, started saying, started comparing the machines that were creating to people with autism. They said, you know, an autism is kind of like a machine-like state, and people with autism prefer objects to other people. So they started normalizing these ideas, which uh, the origin is in the work of Simon Baron Cohen uh, with his empathizing, systematizing. And what he does is he naturalizes sex difference be between men and women. He says, women are natural empathizers, and they want to take care of people, whereas men are the men who build systems, and they're, you know, these, the, they're systematizers. And autism is a, an extreme male brain. So, the, robotici the roboticist that I was working in with autism picked up these ideas from Simon Baron Cohen, and then they started to develop robots. And they started to get millions of euros to develop these robots and to push these ideas. And even when, the, even when and I've actually been in situations when the robots didn't work, they still managed to keep getting the resources in order to uh, promote this perspective. And then you see a number of our articles coming out curing robot autism. So people just don't even care anymore. I mean, think about it. We've come a long way when we think about disability and people of difference. And to go back and start comparing people of, who are different to machines is something I think we should be very concerned about. And I want to rest on this image for a minute because this was um, created by a Brazilian artist. And as you can see, it's a ro an autistic child with his robot. The robot looks more alive than the child. Now, how do I make sense of an image like that? If I took the egocentric paradigm, the I model, then they're just two disconnected entities. You know, there's no relationship between them. If I take the we are all connected, then actually there's no difference between them. So either which either model you use, you're not really going to have the power to explain what's really going on in robotics when they start saying people can have relationships with machines. So I had to look somewhere else. I began to look at attachment studies, how people uh, develop attachments and the importance of attachments in our lives. 
And obviously, there's this important um, finding that every single person in this room is only alive because somebody kept you alive, put clothes on your body, uh, put food in your stomach, kept a roof, loved you, cared for you, talked to you, and all those things. So the idea that somehow we are adult human beings without taking into account we're actually human beings as an outcome of our relationships with each other, which begin as dependencies when we're young, but when we become adults, we then have peer bonding relationships and we then can care for others. And um, people are saying, well, no, we can, we can take um, a species out of its own species, put it in a different environment with machines, and everything's going to be fine. Well, it's not going to be fine because they already started to experiment with this in monkeys in the 50s and 60s. Um, so these are the Harry Harlow experiments. They took an infant monkey from its mother, put it in a cage. One of the, um, it's called the wire monkey experiment. One of the wire monkeys just had food on it. The other uh, monkey had a soft covering. So what, the, what Harry Harlow wanted to do is look at what, which monkey did the infant go to. And the infant would go to the, uh, the wire monkey, eat, and then immediately go to the soft covering. And you can see the absolute distress that this, um, this animal is experiencing. Um, unfortunately, experiments on animals like this still go on, and I think they should be abolished. But not only did the, the monkeys have um, trauma from that early experience, but when they released the monkey back into its community, it couldn't mate, it couldn't eat, it couldn't respond to other monkeys. Because to be a monkey, you need to be in a species with an environment with other monkeys. To be human, we need to be with other humans. And if we start saying, no, actually, we can put objects in the place of people, then we are going to start creating an iron cage for ourselves. And we know this from studies of zoos. They have huge problems in zoos with the fact that they can't get the animals to mate and reproduce. And so, 10 years after I began this research, it happened again. Here now, they started to talk about um, replacing women, uh, mostly women, come on, let's face it, um, girls and women and children with sex dolls and robotic sex dolls. And the arguments behind it was that men already have, um, men, men already prefer kind of relationships with machines, and they don't, they don't really mind if it's a doll or a woman. And in fact, these dolls can become their wives. And they began to make associations between prostitution and sex dolls. And um, on the basis of that, I launched a campaign against sex robots, and I became someone very critical of the commercial sex trade. Because underlying the idea of the commercial sex trade is that men do not have to, and it is primarily men who buy access to human bodies for sex, um, they don't have to take into account the subjectivity of that woman or that boy or that any human being who they're buying, the buying access to, and that person becomes a form of merchandise. You know, their needs and wants and desires aren't, aren't important. They can, uh, they can be overridden because money is exchanged instead. But people aren't property. And if you start reframing the human being as a form of property, then we're end ending back when we're starting to interchange this idea, idea that people and property are kind of interchangeable. And it makes sense in the commercial sex trade because it is a global sex trade. It's worth 100 billion. Uh, pornography is worth so much money that it's too innumerable to count. It features images of women being degraded and abused um, and harmed. And um, unfortunately, Pornhub is the second most visited website in the world, which to me strikes me we've got a huge problem on our hand if we want to have a different kind of consciousness where we're going to abolish slavery and um, have worldwide women's rights. And. Um, you know, clearly in the field, it's a very male-dominated field. So uh, there was lots of debate around signing petitions against autonomous weapons. And um, the people who were signing those petitions were saying, no, we wouldn't sign a petition against sex robots. But I want to say that what happens to women in the world is important. Two women every week die at the hands of a former or ex-partner. There is uh, rape, uh, uh, torture of women, there's prostitution, there's pornography. There are real things happening to women every day 
in this city, across Australia, across the world. And these, these issues are urgent if you believe in women's rights, as I do. But this fantasy that men can be alone with their machines is one that's becoming to dominate. But I would just want to rest on this image because the reality is, is we are, just, we are not showing love for that man by letting him interact with the machine, by disconnecting him from social relationships, by allowing entitlement to other bodies without taking into account the subjectivity of other human beings. We are not showing that man love, we are showing him hate. And um, unfortunately, I think without some intervention, this is the future that we're all going to be living in, and it's going to make uh, the corporations a very tidy sum. Thank you.